Shalom, Brother Onia. Shalom. Good to see so, you. Yeah, good to see you. So, Jackson, you're you're not feeling good? Or is he too, too sick to even talk for us? I'm going to bed. Yeah, I've been, I'm, going to- I'm always sick. I'm going to bed. Emerson's got the questions. Emerson is a very experienced host in these things, having been in the past the proprietor of the Emerson Mo Show. <laughs> All right, uh, just uh, I'm going to switch to my computer. All right. Got a new hairstyle, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll be right back. One sec. Yes, sir. All right, so I got my questions up. got the camera set up. I got a mic, but I haven't set that up, so... I'll get that next time so you can hear my voice, my monotone voice a little better. (laughs) So let's see. Got brother John, sister Laura. Good to see you both. Yeah, I've been enjoying these Q&A, listening to the Q&As with brother Jackson and brother Onia. It's been a blessing for me, and I don't always get to make the Friday night. <clears throat> I do have a few rug rats. I got three boys that keep me quite busy, and I work a bunch of hours, but I'm glad things could work out so we could be here tonight. Yeah, and then, uh Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited tomorrow. I'm going to be helping with the liturgy. So I think that'll be cool. <clears throat> I've wanted to do it for a little bit. So it's nice to get involved. And uh, hopefully I won't get interrupted by my kids. I'll, I'll lock my door. <laughs> and, and I'll, uh, but even sometimes I've been in meetings because I work from home. And uh, man, they've embarrassed me a couple times. But Thankfully, I've been able to keep it relatively under wraps, so it hasn't been a huge deal. But there's definitely some uh, pros and cons to working from home. No getting, no, no doubt about that. But the Heavenly Father has definitely blessed me tremendously that I could be able to be here and be with my boys. I had uh, to be out in California for quite some time. Let me admit, Brother Onia. Let's switch back to the. There we go. Yeah, so it's been. Shalom, brother. Shalom. How's your day been? Oh, it's been okay. This week's been a little bit crazy, but. uh... Oh, same here. I I have a big uh, responsibility for my job and. This week, we were supposed to be finishing our whole year's worth of work, and uh, it turned out the, go- the finish line got pushed out a-, a big way, so now it won't be for like another two weeks. I'll be working on the project until the very end of the year, uh, but I just got to be grateful I'm busy. I know there's a bunch of people that aren't. Yeah. I, have, uh, I haven't taken any days off for a very long time, but uh, I have the first two weeks of uh the first two work weeks of january off as paid so nice so finally you know after such a long time of not getting paid time off um i will be getting that time off so it's much needed i'd like to catch up on some things yeah, well, I'll also just, to, just get a, a breather in, but uh, I will hopefully have some more ability to focus on some of my studies a bit more uh, during that time, and I'll kind of recharge in the new year in that sense. Yeah, that'll be excellent. The Gregorian New Year. Mm, yeah, yeah, Gregorian 
Yep. Will, will you be doing anything to celebrate the two-headed god Janus? <laughs> <laughs> Whom January is named after. Um, <laughs> no, just, well, you know, just uh, spending time with family. They probably will do the, the countdown thing, um, staying up to midnight or whatever. And then uh, just not having to go to work. That's, that's nice because uh, I get that day off. So, Yeah, I do too. I'm grateful for that. I'll take three-day weekends. Yeah. And they want to pay me to stay home with my family. They can do that. I, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, yesterday, there was a crazy snowstorm where I live. Um, basically, we there was different reports. Like so, There was on a low, low end. They were saying we might get something like four to eight inches or something. And then they, there was like a... a a higher like the biggest one that i heard was 12 to 18 inches we ended up getting 30 inches what so 30 yeah. inches of snow <laughs> yeah so <laughs> wow there, yeah it, it was crazy like pretty much almost no one could go to work anywhere I, I actually tried to go to work but then my manager said to to um they say basically don't come in. It's not, you know, not worth it. And uh, no one else was coming in. So don't even bother to show up. So I was already halfway in. So I was like, oh, man. But um, Did you have to shovel shovel, uh, shovel your front yard? Um, so I live with my parents and usually my dad does that. Although this year I've tried to help out a little bit with uh, shoveling the driveway. Like I, he was going to take me into work. He was going to drive me in. So I, I was helping him. Um, shovel the driveway and then all of a sudden we realized that the the road itself was not plowed like they had not plowed it since like in the middle of the night so and but still so we weren't so able to go like, anywhere oh yeah well, at least your manager helped you give you the relief so you didn't have to feel guilty or something like you had to trek through the snow well i actually i actually uh I walked through the snow to the main street. <laughs> you are dedicated. Yeah. You are dedicated. <laughs> it's it's really tiresome to walk through this through like a practically you know two feet of snow to walk it's... through. <laughs> That'll give you a workout. <laughs> yeah. So that was my crazy week. Uh, so and a and a couple of weeks ago um, at work, someone had a seizure. And uh, so that was crazy. But... Oh man, I saw. I came across somebody that was having a seizure. He, there was two guys working on an elevator shaft at a children's museum. So it was like a see-through elevator for you know the special needs kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked over, took a second glance over there, and, and the one guy was holding the other guy, and he, and he was convulsing and stuff. It was yeah. surreal. I started that, praying. The person that ha that it happened to where I work. Uh, uh, they were at, they were basically under like kind of like under my supervision type of thing, um, and it was right. it was probably caused by a computer screen because she was she was at the computer screen, and so I went over to my supervisor and I said uh, someone in our my someone in the groups having a medical issue, and so then all the uh, all the managers and supervisors rushed over. Like at practically everybody, practically all the higher ups came on over and it was a crazy thing. People thought she might die possibly, but luckily she didn't die. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, but that was crazy. But, you know, I, it's possible I might've helped save her life in some small way. Like, cause you know, I alerted the supervisor and then she alerted other people. So, you know, I, nice. might have, I might have helped, you know, in a little bit. <laughs> You're see, a hero. See, my life's not totally worthless, right? Yeah, we all, that, that's how we get used by the creator. You know, we're all like cogs in the wheel. And I'm looking forward to when we get to see how the good choices we made helped like influence so many different things possibly. Yeah. And, uh, once the, the creator shows how our life weaved into his bigger picture, 
think that's going to be an, an exhilarating for most, for a lot of us, probably not for everybody. <laughs> well, the, the other thing too is th probably for all of us. Well, I, I believe that all our choices lead to other uh, small impacts. And so what we do can lead to a lot of good things, but also I think a lot of bad things will happen at the same time indirectly. So we might not want to see everything that happens because of what we did, yep. you, you know, that's what I'm like towards you. Yep. Cause there's going to be people that are choosing their egos constantly and not trying to help their neighbor out or show any, uh, you know, love to the heavenly father, people that well, live their lives solely for themselves. Yeah. And this is something I've even thought of before. We're basically like, you know, I, in, in my personal, uh, spiritual life, I've, I've struggled with, lust issues. Uh, and I, I've basically said to myself in the past, you know, I've said to myself in my head, I've said, I'm not hurting anybody. Uh, I know it's a sin, but it's not like I'm, you know, causing people harm, that type of thing, like other sins, type of thing. you know, kind of like right. minimizing sin. But it's very possible that even sins inside ourselves like that we do to ourselves could actually cause much far more damage to the rest of the world than we realize like because i believe we're all interconnected and you too. spiritually connected there, there's an energy connection between people and so and sometimes it could be <clears throat> it could be as simple as if uh, you do something sinful, it could negatively impact your mind and yeah. sort of like you're self-suggesting like a negative energy to yourself. And then you, because that negative energy is floating around in your head because of your personal choices you made, you then, it kind of leads to other bad choices. Like, so it's like a domino effect. Um, so yeah, we, we think things might be much more harmful due to what we've done than we realize, or to the opposite, uh, much more good from what we've done. But anyways, uh, that's it's all. It's a big right. responsibility to be the image of Elohim, more than I think people know. Yep. All right, so let's get started. I guess. You want to get to some questions? I have quite a bit here. That he sent me, it looks like. <clears throat> uh, we, so, we also we also can. Um, oh yeah, so ask if anyone else had a question. We can have you know people here ask question. Um, did did uh, John Ritter decide to leave? Seems like he dropped uh -oh. out. I think he has connection issues. You said that last time about him. <laughs> um, so you're not able to add people in. Is that the case, or you can add? Them? I am. He made me co-host, so I can okay. add people. In. Because it also looks like you're in, it looks like you're listed twice in my list. You're correct. So you're special, you know. Um, I'm just I'm doing. I just have my phone and my computer going. Oh, okay. Uh, a, my computer isn't as uh, sophisticated as my phone, apparently. Oh. As oddly as that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, we could also like you know we could do the the lots of questions we could do you know what people here want to ask but we could also just kind of do our you know whatever whatever comes to mind whatever we want to say and uh yeah so we'll just take it as it goes so why don't you start with some questions all right so i just want to welcome anyone that's in the chat you're welcome to uh add a question i know i've been in the chat before and i'm like oh you know it didn't come immediately to my mind but it might come later, so you're welcome to add it at whenever that comes to your mind. So, but it looks like there were a list of seg, uh, questions that were submitted to Brother Jackson, and people are curious, and I can't blame them. It's a wonderful thing, and the scriptures have a lot of depth to them and the history too. So, though, the first one on the list is an interesting one. Is I think it has to do with predestination. So it's kind of tricky because, and it talks about, it says, because uh, it's about Judas. Why was Judas Iscariot permitted, uh, predetermined 
as the traitor apostle? Why was Judas Iscariot predetermined as the traitor apostle? So, because Jackson's not here, you're going to take his place, I think. Uh, do you want to share your... I, I pale in comparison <laughs> to your knowledge and Brother Jackson's knowledge. But... Uh, what, I, what, what do I, they I say? Knowledge comes from the mouth of babes or something? What, what was it? <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's right. So... For pre, see, I wrestle with this one too because part of me, it's along the same question as this is like, it's like, why did the creator need the devil? Like, why did he make the devil? Like, if he knew that something bad was going to happen with this being, why make that being? Especially if, you know, if you're the almighty and all knowing. So it's yeah. like, a part of me is like, okay, I guess, does our creator, is this for his amusement? Like, <laughs> is it like, you know, to create that balance that it seems like everyone, you know, we see everywhere in nature and everywhere in the world, but you know, is that balance necessary? Well, Gnostics struggled with this very issue as well. You know, they, just, they, they came to a very different conclusion about it, but they had the same struggle of why would a God supposedly good uh, predestine evil things happening type of thing. Um, so do you, are you kind of on the fence about it or do you have a, do you lean towards a, a position? Well, I could tell you, maybe I have no idea really, to be honest, but I can get, I can speculate. <laughs> and I think like, I just think like we were speaking about earlier about how our choices affect people. Like, yeah. you know, perhaps in Judas's case, he thought like he's, the Messiah, he's going to get get himself out of the situation. Meanwhile, I'm going to make myself some silver on the side, you know, or, you know, I don't know his heart. Like, was he really trying to, to did he know what the Sanhedrin were going to do with them, you know, with him? He was right. so remorseful, supposedly, right? He took his own life, didn't he? Yeah. So it's like he obviously, uh, you know, he wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't proud of what he did. He wasn't, you know, heralding that from everywhere and like, you know, and, and denying him, denying the Messiah, he wasn't, you know, setting up a campaign to slander the Messiah's name afterwards. So I, it could be that he didn't really know what he was doing. It could be that he was manipulated into, into getting it. They, maybe they knew he, there's other unforeseen things that maybe weren't recorded. Maybe they had added, there was added pressures that were putting on him. Like, I just know that, uh, it would stink to be known in history as the guy that betrayed the Messiah with a kiss. Right. That's a terrible way to have your name go down. Well, Melissa says here, someone recently suggested it was because Judas was greedy for money, but I don't, I don't see why that would, that wouldn't really explain why he was chosen. Um, the, the main issue is why would he be chosen if it was known ahead of time that he was going to betray him? Um, so my thoughts on this are, it's a little bit complicated, but basically, first of all, I believe the father is the one who knows all things and ha has the, has like the predestination of everything. I believe the father has predestined literally everything. The son, on the other hand, I believe that the son, the S-O-N, does not have all knowledge of everything that's going to happen. He's, he's told by the father certain things that he needs to know, but he's not told everything. So, you know, the Messiah himself in the New Testament, it tells us a few things. First, it tells us, um, we see where the Messiah prays and says, if possible, let this cup pass from me. What that means in that prayer, he's actually saying, if possible, please don't let me die on the cross at this time. I don't want to die. Please don't let me die. If possible, not my will, but your will, but please, if there's any way I can 
fulfill your will without dying, please don't make me die. That was actually what the Messiah was praying in the garden. Secondly, on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some people believe that he just said that just because he wanted to fulfill the words of David, but that literally does not make sense. Like, it doesn't make sense for him to say something that he didn't actually feel or believe. So when the Messiah was on the cross, he literally felt abandoned by God, and he didn't understand it. And that's why he said, why have you forsaken me? Because he knew that the Father wanted him to die, and that he knew that the Father required him to die in order for salvation to come to the world. But he didn't understand why that was necessary. Because if you think about it, why is it necessary that the Messiah be murdered for our salvation? Think about this, like when Pilate was making the decision, you know, when, when they were bringing witnesses against the Messiah in the court and Pilate was listening, if Pilate all of a sudden said, you know what, he is innocent, I'm not going to kill him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save his life, I'm going to spare him. Like, basically, many Christians would have us believe that that would actually have been a bad thing if, the, if, if Pilate basically said, no, I'm not going to kill him, I'm going to do the, right, the righteous thing and, and spare his life. It's almost like Christians believe that it had to happen in order for us to be saved so that it almost like excuses what they did. And it, it, it's not really a sin if it had to happen for our salvation. On the other hand, if it wasn't inherently necessary and if there were, if there was another way to do it, then it makes sense why the Messiah would say, why are you doing it this way when we could have done it a different way? Why? And I believe the reason is that specifically for predestination, it wasn't just for the salvation. It wasn't just to bring about the atonement, but it was to make sure it would have the greatest positive impact for the entire history of the world. And because of that, he had to, by predestination, he had to die in this type of way. Um, there's also, I believe, something, basically, I believe, due to the free will, sin is inevitable. So, someone's going to sin. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like, um, let's say, let's say you have a few options available to you, three, three options available. And each option results in a, a, uh, an event that you can't really control. You can't control what's behind those cards. Whatever's behind those cards, it's due to free will of those cards, okay? But there's three cards. I'm simplifying it because for, for the father, there's an, like an infinite number of cards. But we'll, we'll limit it to three here. So you have the one card that's... Um, the one card is if Onia becomes saved, then half the world will go to hell or whatever. Card number two is if only it doesn't become saved, then, um, then uh, two thirds of the world will be saved. If he doesn't be, if he's not saved, two thirds of the, of the world will be saved. Um, and the third option is, uh, I don't know, let, let's change it to two options instead of three options. So <laughs> to keep it simple. So basically the first option, I, due to predestination, I will be saved, born again, but half the world will not be born again, because, indirectly because of me being uh, born again. Whereas if he, if he predestines me to not be born again, then through indirect influence of free will, two thirds of the world will be born again. So what's he gonna do? Is he gonna predestine me to be born again or not to be born again? He's gonna, pre, he's gonna predestine me to not be born again because my not being born again will lead 
to far more people being saved by free will indirect uh, reactions. So to explain how this could happen, imagine like with Hitler, for example. Hitler did horrible atrocities, right? But because of what Hitler did, the, basically the, the modern state of Israel exists. Through the Holocaust, Israel exists, modern time today, and the restoration can happen. So if, it had, if the Holocaust had not happened, then the restoration may not have happened. So the idea is that sin is inevitable and bad things are going to happen regardless. If the Holocaust didn't happen, there may have been, if, if, if the father did not predestine the Holocaust to happen through Hitler, it may have happened through 20 other Hitlers. So the father seeing the different possibilities, he said, hmm, what's better? What, what's better to do, predestine a hundred holocausts or just one holocaust? Well, it makes more sense to predestine just one so fewer people are harmed from it. And through that harm, many people can come to be born again and, and be led to the faith indirectly. Uh, so that is how I believe predestination works for everything. Uh, just, just take Paul, for example. I believe Paul was a true apostle. Jackson disagrees, but get, take for sake of argument that my position is correct, and Paul is, in fact, a true apostle. According to the book of Acts, it was the Messiah himself who appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. The Messiah had free will choice to appear to Paul or not to appear to Paul. He chose to appear to Paul. That one act of appearing to Paul led to Paul's conversion. And what happened to Paul's conversion? Everything else throughout all of history happened because of Paul. And of course, the other apostles too. But so much of history is radically influenced by Paul. You would be surprised like how much is impacted. So even in my own personal life, uh, for example, um, I have some past, uh, I have some past, uh, legal issues with a messianic woman. We're on okay terms now, but in the past there were some legal issues and she's a very strongly anti-Paul. So if Paul had not been converted, I probably have never have met her. I would never have had those legal issues um, because she would be a different person. A big part of her spiritual identity is opposition to Paul. That's a lot of people's spiritual identity. A strong part of it is rejection of Paul. Um, and there's just so many other things uh, that Paul influenced that him not being converted would have changed everything. So many church fathers quoted Paul's writings and were highly influenced by what he said. A lot of people justify not keeping the law of Moses Due to Paul, that that could be considered a negative impact right. uh, of Paul. So, really, if you think about it, there's just the one. If if the father was just like, you know what, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna uh, predestine Paul to uh, be become born again. That one act has predestined the entirety of history after that time even if it's not actively predestining everything because it's indirectly linked to it. It's like, uh, how, how many kids do you have, Emerson? Four. You having those four kids, like, it doesn't seem like it's that big a deal, but uh, those four kids will probably, most likely, they will marry someone someday and if they didn't exist or, you know, if they weren't your kids, you didn't have those kids, then the people that they will would have married will now marry someone else. So that means your grandkids don't exist and, and, uh, and the other people that was going to marry them, they are now going to have different uh, grandkids or they're going to have different kids. So entire lineages 
people are completely changed and that has a huge cascading effect on history the, because think about it how many people do you interact with this goes back to what we were talking about earlier with small things in our lives have big impacts to other other people right. um so um so we just don't really fully understand how just one little difference will change everything in history in my belief uh with that said specifically for judas i believe that first of all at least in the old testament there's not any real clear evidence of prophecy of of judas there's the one psalm from the book of psalms but that's not really compelling to me uh it's more of a parallel we know we know the, the biblical writers they did do parallel interpretation like that's what the Essenes did they used the Pesher method the apostles did a similar method where they took a passage from scripture talking about something else and they reapplied it in a principle to the Messiah they they drew lessons from something that was applying somewhere else so the passage which says he put his bread he took his bread with me or something like that referring to Judas, it was actually in the original context, it was David talking about someone else. And only through kind of like, almost like a divine comedy, a divine joke almost, God does these coincidences to kind of show, see, I'm in control here. And these things that David did, I'm fulfilling by repeating it. But, you know, history repeats itself type of thing. If, if Judas decided to not be not betray him that would not have made the book of psalms a false prophecy because it's really not a prophecy of judas in its actual meaning there may have been some apocrypha books which explicitly prophesied of him but we don't know for sure um there are some passages from some apocrypha which indicate that that may be the case like like the ascension of isaiah appears to prophesy of judas um, so that, of course, would be false prophecy if that's a true, authentic prophecy. Um, but so it's it perhaps when the Messiah was choosing the twelve disciples, he may not have known in the beginning who the one was going to betray him. He may not have known that. Uh, Judas was the one that would be the one because um, it talks about in like the epistle of Barnabas, it says the apostles that he chose were not righteous men. They were a bunch of sinners. You know, the, the one uh, Levi also known as Matthew, he was a tax collector, which in that time notoriously were, were considered sinners because they often abuse their role and stole money from people. Skim a little off the top. Yeah. So, um, so the uh, it may be very well the case that he did not really know necessarily at the time who was going to be the one who was going to betray him. You know, he even said to Peter shortly before he was put to death. He said to Peter, um, "Get behind me, Satan." you know, type of thing. So that's pretty, that's pretty harsh uh, thing to say to one of his 12, 12 apostles. And then there were times where he said to his apostles, he said, are you guys going to leave me too? And then the, Peter says, where would we go? You have the words of truth. Where would we go? Um, we know the Messiah did not know all things. There are many passages which tell us this. So, but near the end of his, his ministry, it appears to be the case that the father did did in fact reveal to him that Judas was going to be the one uh, who would uh, betray him. Although a, a interesting uh, spin on it could be, you know how he said, the one who dips his bread in with me is the one that's going to betray me. I'm not saying this is the case, but it's just fun to speculate here. What if the Messiah didn't know who was going to betray him until he saw him dip his bread in 
Uh, so that could have been a sign for the Messiah himself when he said, the one who dips the bread uh, will betray me. I just thought of that on the spot. I'm not saying that's true, but... It's a good possibility. That's interesting. I know there's some, though, that think he was uh, all-knowing, though, all the time. Nah, that can't be, uh, according to the New Testament. Um, at least as, as the Messiah, he could not have been. Maybe, you know, some people believe that before he was Messiah, he knew all things. Or after he resurrected and ascended into heaven, he knew all things. Some people that seems logical. Like, but when he stepped into the earthly form, you know, he took the limitations of man on. Right. That would be, you know, a brain that doesn't compute as efficiently as our Elohim's. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Computing capabilities. Yep. So, um, and it also says that Judas actually had the Holy Spirit. Um, he actually did miracles in the Messiah's name. He healed oh, people. Wow. Uh, th this is talked about in the Gospels, where he sends the 12 out, and he tells them, do not bring this with you. Just bring oh, this, yeah. and he sends them out. And he says, when you go into a city and they receive you, if they don't receive you, then uh, wipe the dust off your feet and go to the next place or whatever. Judas was included in that uh, description. There is a Apocrypha document, which is a little bit controversial and is not 100% authentic necessarily. Like In other words, it's not 100% confident that it's authentic. But I believe it could be authentic in an original form, and that's the Gospel of Judas, which uh, is found in Nag Hammadi. In its current form, it appears to be Gnostic in certain passages. But the problem is the, pa the book is not perfectly uh, complete. There's a few places where it's uh, corrupted in the manuscript, fragmentary, so we don't know some of the partial details. But what we do know is the Gospel of Judas tells us that um, there is, uh, it tells us that homosexuality is a sin. It tells us uh, that, it tells us that uh, in order to be saved, you have to stop sinning. Things you would be surprised to see in a Gnostic document. And then there's also things like um, Judah, Judas is told ahead of time that he is going to be the one who betrays him. Um, and and then you see um, Judas has a vision, and he sees the apostles condemning him, and then he sees the apostles doing uh, sacrifices in a way that is not pleasing to to God. And so the traditional scholars interpret this as saying that the uh, Gnostics wrote this to condemn the Orthodox Church. But we know for a fact that throughout history, the church became corrupt early on. So this could be an authentic prophecy to Judas, revealing to him that the church will, all, will become corrupt. The church under the, you know, it, the church will be, will be founded by the other apostles. But that church that the apostles uh, make will itself become full of sin and corrupt. So this was a vision that was revealed to Judas, uh, according to this Gospel of Judas document. Um, so th there's a bunch of different things like that. But, uh, so I would say that Judas was chosen um, for the reason that the Messiah, the Father wanted the Messiah to die in the way that he did for a specific purpose. Not because it was required for salvation or atonement, but because it brought about a greater good for the entire scope of history after that time. So, uh, Judas' betrayal, while horrible and evil, it also has influenced the world in a positive way by all the people who have been inspired by the Messiah's sacrifice and the torment that he went through on the cross. Everything he went through has been an inspiration to billions of people. 
and it has positively impacted the world in a ways we cannot even begin to comprehend. Right. So Judas was was, was uh, part part of that process. But like I said, sin is inevitable. So if Judas was not the one who was going to betray, it may have been someone else. So for example, why did Judas betray? You know, you know who planted that idea in his head? Judas did not go to the priest and say to them, hey, I want money. Um, I, I'm going to betray him for you. Instead, it was, the, it was those people who went to the, who came to the apostles and tried to convince them to betray the Messiah. So if Judas was not the one that they convinced, they might have convinced someone else in the discipleship group. So if it wasn't Judas, it could have been one of the other apostles, Peter, for example. You know, Peter, we know he denied the, uh, he denied the Messiah. So if, if, some of the priests had threatened Peter and said, we're going to kill you if you don't do this. Peter might have said, okay, you know, all right, fine, I'll do it. Um, we don't know that would have happened. I'm just saying it's a possibility. And then uh, we also, it, it may not have even been one of the 12 apostles. It may have been, you know, he had other followers too. According to the Gospels, he also sent out 70 disciples to preach into the different nations. It could have been one of his 70 disciples who betrayed him. Uh, so it may have actually been inevitable that one of his people was going to betray him because the people who were trying to get him killed were so relentless that they would stop at nothing and they were going to find someone in his group with enough money, enough money to bribe someone. Almost definitely, you know, a lot of people in his group that he converted were poor people. So... Um, so it was bound to happen. It was bound that they would, we would, they would find someone who would be willing to do it for 30 uh, shekels or whatever, whatever the currency was that they paid. So those are kind of my thoughts. Uh, you know, sin is inevitable. Someone was going to betray him almost certainly. Because someone was going to betray him, it was really up to the father to predestined who it was that was going to betray him. Was it going to be Judas or someone else? And it's possible that maybe Judas betraying him was the best way, to, the best type of betrayal, uh, because maybe some of the other betrayals that could have happened would have been far worse and, and caused far more pain and suffering in the world throughout the scope of history. So it's possible that Judas being the one who betrayed him created the most amount of good compared to alternate realities that would have happened had Judas not been the one because someone else would have betrayed him and far more evil would have been as a indirect result. Again, it's speculation, but it's, it's, I believe it's speculation is not necessarily wrong if it's done in a way that is furthering the truth. It supports the truth. It gives you, it gives you possibilities and those possibilities are valid and they explain why something most likely would happen or why something, why the father would do something. It doesn't give us 100% answers, but it gives us multiple answers that are almost certainly true. One of them has to be true most likely. So long answer to the question, but it's a very deep question. It is deep. So uh, one of the things you had mentioned was about the Messiah having free will. And Sister Melissa was asking, how do we know Messiah had free will to come to Paul? That was one of the things you mentioned while you were talking. Well, um, you know, there's a whole debate about what does free will mean. But if you have the ability to make choices, that is what I mean by free will. You can choose. If you can choose, then you have a will. It's called a will because you can choose, make choices. And the very act of being able to make choices is a will which implies that you have the ability to make the choice between one option and the other, and you're not forced to do one or the other. So anyone who has, who makes a choice has a will. So, and I'm simply calling it free will, but that's just a, you know, a, no one really has free will because everything we do is influenced by other people. You know, uh, Jackson, um, 
he's the one that normally hosts this stuff. So Emerson chose by his will to host this meeting. But if Jackson hadn't decided that he was sick, sorry, Jackson, uh, if, <laughs> if Jackson hadn't decided that he was too sick to be able to host, um, then Emerson would, he would not have approached Emerson to do what he normally does. So, um, so because of Jackson's choice, that led to Emerson doing his choice. So was he really free to, to host this? He, he was led to host this by Jackson. He still chose freely to do it, but it would not have happened unless everything else lined up to make it happen. And that's how it is with all our choices we make, you know, who we marry. We, the only way we can choose who we marry is if the person that we choose to marry made their choices in their life and then they also have to choose to marry us and there's just a bunch of things that has to happen it has to all line up in the exact way for it to all happen the way it has happened so um the messiah has free will it's not free just like no one's will is free but it's free in the sense that uh you can it's a it's a choice and he makes those he made the choices he made the father has choices he makes choices as well um what okay who's that Good. got a question i think he was unmuted briefly uh well, he said, uh, okay, so his brother, uh, forget his real name, but Tower Time. Uh, you don't think we each have free will? So I was, yeah. So did did he just come on? Or uh, he, he came on while we were, you uh, like, you were talking when he came on. He's been on for minutes, okay. a good chunk of the time, I'd say. Okay, well, basically what I was just saying is we have what we call free will, we have, but it's not as free as we think. So in other words, we do have free will. But like I said, it's not as free as we think. Kind of like this. Um, if you're a slave, do you have free will? Yes, you do have free will. But it's limited because you're a slave and you're under oppression and you can't really do whatever you want to do. You're kind of forced to do, you have limited options due to your, due to your nature, due to other people around you. You can't do whatever you want, so your will is limited. In that sense, it's not free. But because you are a, a independent person, even though you're a slave, you do have some freedom to make your choices. You can run away from your master. You can refuse to obey. You know, you might, you might be punished. You could even be killed if you disobey. But these are choices you have available. Um, so we have these choices and yes we, he set uh he set before us life and death to obey or disobey that choice is available to us uh we ha we all have that choice but do we have the choice to who we are born to some people believe we do uh but there's not compelling evidence that that's the case um some people believe that they have memories that, that they have chosen to be born but um I believe currently that we don't choose who we're born to and that that is something we're, for, we're forced into this world against our will. You know, it's not, or not against our will, but it's not even our will that makes it happen. We don't choose our parents. We don't choose our siblings. Um, right. We don't choose that, where we're born, when we're born, the, time, yep. you know, the period of time. And in many ways... <clears throat> well, so we do, we choose our friends, but we don't choose who we can choose our friends from. We don't choose our friend, our pool of people we can make our friends from. I mean, I mean, I can go on Facebook right now and, and, and scroll through random people online and try to send them a message on Facebook and say, "Hey, be my friend." But um, but someone had to create Facebook for that to happen. You know, like all these things have to be created by someone else, and, and someone had to make a Facebook account. And all these different things have to happen 
So there's so much of our lives that pretty much everything in our life is dependent on other people and other choices other people make. So in that sense, it's kind of um, deceptive to say we have free will, hmm. but we do have free will in the technical sense that we can make choices and we're not forced to make those choices. We have the ability to choose of, of the options available to us, we can choose whatever we want. But we're still predestined by everything we do. We, we are predestined, I believe. It Except seems like a paradox. Some people, yeah, some people say it's a paradox. But it's kind of like, like, a, like what I said, you know, Jackson, in a sense, predestined you to be the host uh, today. But you still chose to do it. But he knew. He, knows, he knew you so well that he knew you were going to agree to it. So he said come on, be the host today. And you said, okay. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he predestined you to do it, but your free will also chose to do it. So it works in harmony. It's kind of like, imagine if, imagine if the all-knowing father decided to play a game of chess with you. He knows every move you're going to make. He knows whatever move he does, he knows how you will react and what move you'll do in response. So if he wants you to do a specific move, like let's say he moves, let's say he wants you to move uh, your rook to a certain spot. He can't just say, you know what, I'm going to move this random pawn, and that's always going to make you do move, move that rook piece. Instead, he looks at all the pieces and says, which pieces do I have to move in order for him to freely choose to move his rook piece? Hmm. I'm going, to move, I'm going to move these pieces so that he will choose to move his rook. So it's kind of like a game of manipulation in a sense where the father knows what you'll do, but he can't make you do it. So he has to tinker around with things until the things line up in a way that leads to the best result of what he's trying to make happen. In the chess game scenario, he wants to win, and he's definitely going to win, because he knows, you know, he's all-knowing, so he knows how to beat anyone in chess. So, but he can't make you do whatever move he wants you to do independent of what he does. So he has, to, he has to move the exact piece necessary for you to freely choose to respond in the way he wanted you to respond. And that's an analogy because it applies in a much grander scope to everything in life where... If he wants you to do a certain thing, he may have to do other things first to be predestined. For example, if he wants you to be, become born again, maybe your mom has to die in a car accident. Because maybe you're so arrogant and so full of yourself in your sins that you just would never uh, let your guard down because you're so cocky. I'm not talking about anyone here specifically. Uh, but... Um, but then if, you're, if the one you love so much, your mom, is taken away, then you may, uh, through that, be broken down and, and come to realize how bad you are and you come to repentance through, through a tragedy. But it goes beyond you because the predestination isn't just about you because you, it has to take into account the entire world scenario. So what happens uh, if if the mother gets into a car accident, well, someone else has to be involved in that car accident. Does somebody else die? If someone else dies, how does it affect that family? Uh, and um, and all, the little, all the little small things that cascade from that one car accident uh, will have a huge impact on, on the rest of the world indirectly. Over time, the small changes have big cascading effects. So, um, like I said, he, if he wants you to be born again and the only way for you to be born again is for a certain tragedy to happen, then he may choose that then he will choose to predestine that tragedy to happen. But in order for that tragedy to happen, other things have to happen first to make that tragedy happen. So those things have to be predestined. And for those things to happen, things before that has to happen and be predestined and so on and so forth. So really you go back to the beginning of time. This goes back to what you said earlier with why did Satan fall? 
and why did uh, Adam uh, rebel in the garden? And really everything that has happened was because of the, of the sin of Adam in the garden. If Adam had not listened to Eve, the entire scope of history would have not happened. Every murder that happened will not have happened. Every rape that happened would not have happened. But here's the catch. Other murders would have happened. Other rapes would have happened. Um, and perhaps there would have been far more murders or far more rapes. We don't know what would have happened had Adam not done that sin. Yeah, it's because getting on the, the predestination thing and, and free will, that was the, the original one for me that came to my mind is I pondered is like, if the creator knew what would happen for making the tree of knowledge of good and evil, like why even put it in their reach? Like why even have it in there? Right. But he knew what was going to happen and he knew all the things that would cascade from that event. And, you know, he brought us to where we are now. Yeah, and the other, the other thing um, is, so I also think uh, the tree of knowledge was created originally good and not bad. The tree of knowledge, good and evil. Um, I actually view the Garden of Eden almost as like the the um, the central, almost like a central organ on the earth. Because I believe the Earth is actually a living being, and um, I think those trees in the garden are holy. According to Jubilees, they're holy. Every tree it says in Jubilees, every tree in the garden was holy. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life were especially holy, both of them. And if if though if holiness is desecrated. It has very negative consequences. It could be that well, I basically believe that the fall is due to the Earth's immune system. So you know how the immune system has like a reaction to virus. You know, a negative uh, in foreign invader comes in and it and identifies it as a harmful invader that's trying to kill it. So it sends out antibodies or whatever you know to protect itself. And it has violent symptoms sometimes to get rid of the illness. You know, uh, pe people will uh, throw, throw up to get something toxic out of the body. They'll have convulsions and all kinds of things. In a similar way, I believe the earth reacts to humans in this kind of way. Because of the sin in the garden, the earth identified it as a... As a um, a harmful invader like a virus and so basically now because we're viewed as the enemy by the earth the earth keeps sending stuff to protect itself Hur hurricanes earthquakes all these things are sent to uh, to protect the earth I think uh, we have some noise disturbance i muted it we can go back okay. <laughs> um so basically uh i think it makes a lot of sense and also um according to one document satan was the one who created the tree when he was originally good um oh, interesting and then and then uh, after Satan fell away, then it was banned because it had, say, and then I think Satan might have put poison on it or something. So the tree was created originally good, and then Satan polluted it. And so the father said to avoid that tree because it was uh, poisoned by Satan kind of thing. Uh, so that's one take on it. But the other take on it is I believe that they would have eventually... It wasn't a don't ever partake of this tree. It was more of a don't take of it right now, even though it didn't say right now. I don't think, I don't think the father necessarily, or I think it was actually the son talking to Adam. Uh, I don't think it, Adam was told that he was eventually going to partake of it. 
but I think that was the plan. I think eventually, there's even an apocryphal book that, that uh, the Apocalypse of Peter in the, the Arabic version um, that actually claims that it has the Messiah saying that he would have given Adam the tree of knowledge of good and evil at a later time. So, um, the question of why was it created? I believe it was, I believe the tree of knowledge of good and evil may have been one of the central organs, like a, a, a vital organ of the earth. And so uh, if the tree of knowledge of good and evil was, wasn't created, then, uh, then the earth wouldn't be able to live, perhaps. That's my theory. And it's, it could be regarded as speculation, but I think, I think it's a very plausible theory. It makes sense. And I, that, that's, a, that's a struggle. Why would, you, why would he create the tree unnecessarily? I think if the tree was necessary to create for the earth's life, then that's a viable reason why it would be created. If it was originally created good, and the scriptures say it was originally good, then um, I think there, that, that gives us an explanation. And um, some documents say the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the grapevine. So basically alcohol from, from wine is the forbidden fruit, which later on, these same documents basically tells us that it was changed from a curse to a blessing. And it was, you know, kind of like how before the flood, meat was forbidden. But after the flood, meat is uh, now permitted. In the same way, the forbidden fruit was the grapevine, according to this a couple documents. But after the flood, it was permitted to now be used, but not in excess to drunkenness. Um, but then uh, who, who would have gotten past that? Carib with all the so the fiery sores to get in that garden and get a seed from that tree. <laughs> if that were the case. Well, it wouldn't necessarily be the, um, like, there may have been multiple uh, offspring of that at first. Uh, like the tree of knowledge of good and evil in, in the garden um, may not be, like, the only one of its kind. It just may be, like... Uh, like for example, the tree of life. It might, it, it could be something almost like a, I forget what it was, but it actually describes it in the book of Enoch, I think, uh, what, what type of fruit it was. And the, there may be other trees that were offspring from the tree of life outside of the garden, but outside the garden, it doesn't have the life force that, that it has in the garden maybe. So uh, it could be that the trees outside the garden don't have the same, don't have as strong of an impact. Again, to some extent, we're speculating because there are there are these things of confusion, things that are why is it why is this the case? All I can tell you is certain things that Scripture says on in certain apocryphal books as well, like the thing I talked about with the the wine, that comes from Third Baruch, the book called Third Baruch. Um, I can't remember if Third Baruch is the one also that says uh, Satan put his uh, is the one who created it or or not. But um, yeah, so now there were some things stated by people here. A yeah, parallel universe came up a couple of times. Um, and let's see there. Laura's just saying, uh, Laura is one of the people. I, I, the reason I mentioned it earlier is because Laura has talked about this before. She's one of the people who believes that she chose to be born into this life. Um, and I actually know a few people who believe that. Uh, I have a friend named Ty. He lives in Virginia, Ty Wiggle uh, or Weigel. And uh, he believes due to a, due to a memory or what he believes is a memory of him p before he was born. He believes he was uh, cho he chose to be born to his life. Um, so 
let me see here. Um, uh, so talking about the Truman Show, the Truman Show, you know, the, the one guy Truman, everything was surrounding is was all about him. I don't think that's the case. Um, um, I think, uh, you know, everybody's, everybody's Truman. It's not just one person and everybody else is focused on Truman. It's everybody is a Truman and everything's about them and not about them. Everything's about us and everything's completely not about us. Um, All depends on your perspective. Yeah. I mean, think about this. How many galaxies are there in the world? And, and well, that's if they're really galaxies. Uh, well, just think of how, 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 big, how big space is. Even if you believe in flat Earth, space is pretty big, okay? I, believe so, there's a, I brought it up before in the chat, but it was about the, uh, the electric universe theory. What's that? Because a lot of this stuff that they see in satellites and images, they can replicate with plasma. And anything you do in plasma in a laboratory can be magnified and it will repeat the same results on a grander scale. So they can make many galaxies with plasma. They can make many grand canyons as well with plasma. Are you just saying they would create, they create like illusions or something? Uh, it's just like the way that the energy behaves in certain environments. So it's like if there could be galactic plasma, but uh, because everybody buys into this idea of gravity, uh, but there's the contemporary of Einstein was uh, Tesla and Tesla was a big proponent of the electric universe. And, and there's a bunch of other doctors and stuff that are into it. And I think that their explanations are pretty, pretty good. Definitely worth looking into. Yeah. Well, there's so many things we don't know about the universe and so true. I think it's very positive. I didn't know. I kind of didn't want to think this, but I've come to the conclusion that, there is a really good chance that there may be other worlds and planets where there's people. It would might not be people, but it might be other living beings who are having histories of their own. And we, we don't know. Uh, something else I've been thinking about recently is I believe animals are spiritual beings, uh, fully capable of sin, just like us. One of the things I struggle with is the very short lifespan of insects. Some insects have a very short lifespan. Um, now, some, some believe that some insects have less than a day lifespan. That's not true. Um, those ones that supposedly have a less than one day lifespan, they actually have a longer lifespan. The scientists are just, uh, they're, not, they're only counting the adult form. The, what they call the adult form has only a 24 hour period or less, but all their forms, like their baby forms as well, their earlier forms taken all together, it's, it's more than 24 hours. That's a good point. Um, but that's something I struggle with because if they have the ability to choose uh, right and wrong and be righteous or unrighteous, if they're living only a year, it just seems such a short amount of time to live your life and make choices and, and be able to choose righteousness or not. And not only that, but the sheer number of creatures that exist, like, like they claim that there's like trillions. I don't know how true this is. How do they know kind of thing? But uh, they claim that there's trillions of like ants and stuff like that in the world. And if that's the case, like, according to my belief they all have spirits so but but they die like every i don't know every year or something or every couple of years they they all die and new new ants are being born all the time so it's like do they all, they all have spirits um and then if they do like how many spirits will ever exist is there a limit to spirits and then there's some people who believe that all spirits come from just one spirit. Um, like, like first there was Adam and, and then all humans born after that are simply the same spirit with a different genetic expression. I don't know if that's true, but that's it. That, that could explain, um, that could explain it, but it wouldn't explain when this is going to end. When is it going to end? 
Uh, I believe once all the spirits that are supposed to be born are born, then it'll end. But the question is, what, what is that number and why is it that number? All this pain and suffering, it didn't have to happen necessarily, so why did it happen? Is there an end result to all this? I believe, like I said, I believe that once every spirit that's able to be born is born, then the end will come. But when do we reach that number? It's so mind-boggling, and, it, and it's really uh, hard to, to struggle with because, like, like I said, for animals or insects that have a short lifespan, how can they effectively uh, choose righteousness or not? And then in eternal life, you know, in the day of judgment and resurrection day, mosquito, I believe mosquitoes are going to be resurrected. And I'm trying to wrap my brain around how is this possible? How does this make sense? How can mosquitoes be in eternal life? What's their purpose? Maybe they're supposed to be blood sucking the uh, unbelievers or something for eternity. I don't know. But uh, I definitely don't want to have them. I'm not a fan of mosquitoes. I'm in Florida. And <laughs> they're terrible. They, they, uh, they, they're for the unbelievers for eternity, maybe. I've often considered them possibly like a genetic engineered thing from the, the Nephilim, maybe. <laughs> That's why there's... I, would, I wouldn't say genetic engineered, but it uh, could be genetic corruption due to that, to, due to what they did. Um... Okay, but then uh, Melissa says, how do we know what we are predestined to do? We don't know. The ability for it to be predestined requires us to not know ahead of time. If we knew ahead of time, then it would make it almost impossible for what we're supposed to do to be done. It's almost like, it's almost like, um, have you ever tried to like, like talk and then like a bunch of people are staring at you? And it makes you like self-conscious and you're like, uh, what am I doing? Or like, let's say you're, let's say you're at your job. Okay. You're at your job. I don't know if you can relate to this Emerson and anybody else here, but if you're at your job and like you're by yourself on un unsupervised or like maybe supervised, but not like actively being watched, you can kind of like, you know, freely do your good, your job and you do it well. But if someone's literally standing right next to you and watching you to make sure you do everything right, that's a lot of pressure, and it actually makes right. me do. It makes me do worse. <laughs> right. When they're constantly staring at you, it makes me very uncomfortable. So the idea is, if we have a knowledge of, oh yeah, I'm about in about five minutes, someone's gonna pull up and point their gun at me, and they're gonna try to kill me, and then I have to wrestle them to the ground and take their gun away. Thinking about that, anticipating it, would make me so nervous. I might mess it up when it happens because I know it's going to happen ahead of time, but maybe by not knowing it, that is necessary for me to be able to do what I'm supposed to do because we act on instinct. We act on, uh, on, on like kind of like what happens in the moment type of thing. So really predestination works by us not knowing the future. If we know the future, it makes, predestination more complicated and almost impossible in many ways um see let's see because like for example if if it's like um yeah so you're i i'm predestined to uh end the zoom call right now no i'm not going to well then if i just chose not to end the call then i wasn't predestined to do it in the first place so if you can if you can undo predestination, then it's not predestination. And you have the ability to undo it if you know it in advance. So because of that, it makes it, um, it makes it far more probable for predestination to happen if you don't know what's going to happen. That's my take on And then let's see here. Trying to cover things that were said here. We only did one question. <laughs> That's a big question. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I believe she said, Laura said, I believe we agree to be born to our lives and our mission or not. We know what our lives will be like and we can say no to it. But once we are born, we don't remember. And then she says, if we are going to have a really hard life, we agree to it before we are born. 
we know before we are born. Everything we go through is for the sake of the Father and the salvation of others. So I disagree with that reasoning and logic. So um, what, what you believe, Laura, could be true in the sense of you and others may have chosen to be born. Maybe we all chose to be born. But that does not mean that it's morally necessary that that has to be the case. So you, the, the argument you're using to, to, to suggest why it has to be the case is that if we're going to be born into a really hard life, it has to be something we've chosen. But that implies that you know by predestination everything's going to happen. And you, we, we don't know what our life's going to be like. We don't know how hard it's going to be unless we are all knowing and only the father is all knowing. Some people believe that after you die, you become an angel and angels are all knowing as well, but that's not true. Angels are just like humans. They don't know everything. They, they might know a lot more than us because they've been around since the beginning. They could observe throughout history and learn a lot more, but they're still uh, finite beings. So um, only the father knows all. And um, so I think it's not really the case to say that only the, it, it, we have to choose to be born into a difficult life in order for it to be okay for a difficult life to, ha difficult life to happen. We know, according to scripture, that we will have a difficult life based on what the choices we make in this life and what people in our community do. So if you do a bad sin in this life, according to scripture, it causes your generations to be polluted. Um, if you are unclean and sinful and wicked, your pollution lasts in your genetic uh, offspring for three generations consecutive, three generations, according to scripture. And for some sins like incest, you know, a father having relations with their child, according to scripture, 10 generations to get that abomination out of your ge genetic code. Wow. A, gen a generation is you have a child, that's one generation. They have a child, second generation. That child has another child, and so on and so forth. For 10 generations straight, only after 10 generations, then that person is considered pure enough, healthy enough to be free of that harm that the prior ancestor caused. So, um, like, so that's what Lot had to go through with his daughters. Yeah. And so like... Um, speaking of Lot, you know, Lot was kidnapped. Um, Abraham rescued him. Abraham rescued him. But Lot didn't choose to be born to a life that he knew, oh, yeah, I'm going to be kidnapped. And then, oh, yeah, I'm going to choose a life where I'm going to sleep with my daughters. You know, he wasn't choosing a life like that. He, he, if he did choose, it was simply, if there is a choice of of where you were to be born, it's not, I don't believe it would be, if you choose this, you know that you're gonna suffer a lot by choosing this body. Instead, it would be more, I think it would be more of uh, maybe maybe the, the father gives ability to choose what nation to be born to or what time period, yeah, things like that. But like I said, there's the whole discussion of how our spirits created. For a long time, I believed, until recently, I was convinced that all spirits were created on the first day of creation and that we're all waiting before we're born. We're all waiting before we're conceived to uh, enter a body. But now I'm not so sure about that because there is an alternate theory where a lot of church fathers apparently believed this in earlier times, there's a, there's a theory where instead only the one spirit was created in the very beginning of each, of each um, animal ancestor. And from that one spirit, basically whoever is born, that DNA creates a spirit. It's not a spirit that comes down and chooses to be born it's simply the conception creates a body and the body creates a soul and the soul then becomes a spirit. 
uh, or receives a spirit through the the uh, DNA of the ancestor. It receives a spirit. That's the alternate theory. And I, I used to think that that was definitely not true. But over time, I've tried to come to realization that some of the things that I've in the past been, oh, that's definitely not true. I've come to realize, you know what, that actually could be true. And that, because some that could actually give a better explanation to some things I'm confused about. So it's one of the things that I don't know um, anymore, whether we're all created on the first day or whether we're created as we are born uh, or, or not born, but after sometime during the womb, after life comes into the fetus, once life comes into the fetus, I believe according to the book of Clement, it's after 40 days of conception the Ethiopian book of Clement, it's after 40 days of conception when life starts. So at that point, I believe that's when the spirit enters the fetus. So either that's when the spirit is created or the spirit comes down from the heavens that was always there from the beginning. Those are the two options. and I'm not sure which is correct. Um, hold on here. So we're getting close to the end, and I know, like we said, we kind of talked about this one topic the whole time. Um, let's see. Laura was just saying stuff that she agrees with uh, animals uh, having the uh, spiritual nature. Um, Laura says, is there no way to break the curses of the three generations and ten, or ten generations? There's no way except by miracle healing. Like, you know, the Messiah healed lepers. He, he healed menstruating women. Uh, all kinds of things. He healed people from blindness, raised people from the dead. So, yes, it is possible um, to uh, break through miraculous intervention uh, the 10 generations or the three generations, but there's no indication that, that God has done that or he, or that he will do that, but he has the power to do it. And he may have done it in unknown times that we have no record of, but like, like I, I said, in, I think have you, you've heard of epigenetics, right? Yeah. So I think that by us making positive choices and reading scripture and praying that we can help, maybe add some balance to it, the, the genetic code and help uh, improve. But if you uh, choose to ignore it, or if you uh, choose to obviously participate in it, then you're just gonna compound it if you participate, or if you ignore it, then, you know, then there's no remedy being made in your, your, your DNA or in your, your, your being. Uh, I, yeah, but I don't think we have the ability to fully uh, get rid of it, but we, we can definitely like, our positive choices in life could significantly diminish its impact on us, I think. Um, but then, uh, what's Tower Time's name again? I forget. Steve, is it? Um, he says, wasn't that just before Messiah? Wasn't that just before the Messiah? I think what he means is the generational curse stuff. I don't believe it's just before the Messiah. I believe those laws are science laws they're natural laws and that they they're not spiritual laws they are actual natural laws and that it's we still see it to this day that if you are corrupted your dna is going to be corrupted for several generations it's, it's the same scientific principle that's been since the beginning of time i think um so is that going off that logic then technically you wouldn't want to like date the son or daughter of a murderer then, right? Like if someone's parents were atrocious well, or they did something heinous, then wouldn't that be something to consider before you made union with that individual? They would have to, um, it would be more of an issue if it was before they were born or before they were conceived. So if, if they murder someone and then they had a child, it's different than if they uh -huh. had a child, child first and then they commit the murder. Interesting. Kind of like with Lot's daughters. Let's say he he didn't, he probably didn't, but let's say he had three daughters. Let's say his first daughter 
did not sleep with him and had children, but his other his later two daughters did, and they had his children. The the, the children from the, the the two sisters, you know, um, Moabites and Ammonites, those are the cursed line. That's the cursed line. But the line from his first daughter, which, like I said, didn't actually exist. I'm just making it up for the example. Uh, that first daughter was not polluted, and therefore her line is pure. Just because her father later did that sin doesn't pollute her line. But if he did that sin first, that may even even um, let's say he let's say he slept with his daughters, and then he had a an, a third daughter after that. Now she could be influenced by that negative uh, sin. But scripture tells us that the, the normal requirement of uncleanness for, ex, it pretty much is only for like, uh, um, like uh, genetic pollution, like uh, what I mean is like things like incest and stuff, that require, that's so polluted and corrupted in the DNA, it requires 10 generations. But everything else, all other sin, is three generations. So um, they're considered Gentiles, basically. And according to the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you could see this in Deuteronomy too, as well, uh, and probably uh, maybe Leviticus or Exodus, basically says that there's three generations. For three generations, he visits the sins of the Nicobes to the, to the children. For three generations, it says, and um, and it says that in, if gentle Gentiles want to become Israelites, they become proselytes, and for three generations, they cannot be considered fully Israel. But after three generations, the fourth generation is fully Israel. So um, that's for all other sins besides like the incest type, which creates the uh, severe corruption of the d DNA. All right. All right. So we're pretty much near the end. Let me see what else we have. Did you want to? I kind of, I kind of talked a lot, Emerson. So you didn't have as much time to say stuff. Do you want to say something? I'm glad I got to help out. It's good. I'm glad to hear you talk. I enjoyed it. Because still, uh, still there, Jackson. <laughs> What, what else were you going to say, Emerson? You were saying you enjoyed it. Yeah, I've enjoyed it, and I'm glad I could help out. And No, I enjoyed listening to you talk, too. You know, like, uh, you have, uh, you're very thoughtful, and uh, it's, uh, I think the people listening also enjoyed it. Oh, for Sister Melissa, Brother Jackson's not feeling well, so definitely keep your, but he said he's almost always not feeling well, so just keep like, him in your prayers. Like I said earlier, by his choice, he is not feeling well. No, I'm just joking. Um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, I think it was a good uh, good chat. Um, there was something else I was going to say, but can't remember. Um, I appreciate the you guys coming on. The, the only other things that we talked about were parallel universes, I'll just say, I believe in non-actual parallel universes. What that means is there are parallel universes in the mind of God that he can see, and he knows, he has full knowledge of those parallel universes, but they don't actually exist. They're only there as like a, um, as like a side consideration. Uh, and then it's possible probably not the case but it's possible that prayers from from parallel universe that doesn't exist could somehow have an impact i don't know what it's kind of complicated stuff but i don't really think there really are parallel universes i think it's just i think it's just kind of like a model that he sees kind of like a computer model that a, a what if scenario he sees all the what ifs but those what ifs don't actually exist the only what if that does exist is this if and 
and I don't really know much about string theory, so I can't really uh, speak about that. Um, oh, I, here's what I was going to say. I, re I remember now. I was just going to make a joke. I was going to say Emerson's much better than Jackson. That's why I was saying, Jackson, are you still there? Because I want him to be Jackson there. has good answers. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> oh, man. He's, so, very, he's done a lot. I enjoy yeah. Brother Jackson. Well, we're supposed to do a a uh, interview thing. We talked about this. I don't know when we'll do this, but we were going to interview Jackson. Yeah, I think we might do it on Monday if he's filling up for it. He wants to, because I have the questions I have for him, and then he wants to switch it up and ask me questions about Bitcoin since I'm kind of knowledgeable <laughs> about that topic, and he's curious. And I you, guess he wants you to... want everybody to get Bitcoins, right? Do I? Well, I think it's uh, powerful in taking the money from the government and putting yeah. it in the hands of the people instead. So do you have Bitcoin? And if so, do you have at least one Bitcoin? <laughs> that is the most commonly asked question. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. But the interesting thing, well, we could t come on Monday and we'll talk about it. How about that? I don't want to detract from, from this. And I, yeah, I have a, it's a, <clears throat> an interesting topic. So if things work out on Monday, Brother Jackson and I will be talking more about that. Should I come on for that one? What what time was that supposed yeah, to be you on? You, aren't you? I think you got you're in a little bit into cryptos, aren't you? Um, I I do uh, not so much crypto. I do like stocks, but uh, oh okay okay. But um, but I mean I mean more for the interview for Jackson. What time is that supposed to be up? He hasn't said, made it official. He messaged me, uh, t it was uh, yesterday about it. So I told him that I'd like to do that. And okay. uh, Monday should work, he said. So So you're going to interview just, him. Yeah. And then, and then you, you saw the questions I'm going to have. Uh, or I'm going to have, it's just I want us to, like you were suggesting, like, so we can understand Brother Jackson better and where he comes from. Because, you know, right. I think a lot of people will appreciate that. Cause, and, you know, he's a pretty humble guy. So we're going to have to, we'll drag it out of him. <laughs> what, what, what what the Ahad's about and things like that. Yes, his mission and things like that. I think it'll be great. Yeah, and then are we supposed to do an interview for me on a separate time or something? Yes, I separate... definitely want to do one with you as well and so we can dig more into like your mission and what you're doing. And I think something that would be good is to like do kind of like an introduction to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. You know, something that's so Because I've met people that are curious about it. And it'd be great if we could just like share that video with them and you know people that are interested they can get an introductory and right. see like why it's significant and how why it is uh made the impact that it has on people like yourself and me and brother jackson you know right and then we could do an interview with you for you and then we could interview different yeah, i people. think that's a great idea what you suggested i think that would be awesome if we Got different, the different, different members people. of the Yahad because the truth is, is all of us have something very special and unique about us. And I think uh, many of us are probably just humble and, uh, you know, we don't like necessarily being in the limelight, but I think we should do it because uh, there's some benefits to doing that and help us to get to know uh, different members of the Yahad too. And, you know, we are a family and uh, what better way to get to know each other? You just got to be comfortable putting that out on the internet for yeah. the world to see. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I know that Jackson and I are the most humble people I know. So, you know. Oh, how not humble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the one thing. I'll just say this. Uh, there's the one passage in the Torah which says Moses was the meekest man on earth. And people believe that Moses wrote that. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Like, Moses is the meekest man on earth. It's like in Numbers or something, or Exodus. I can't remember which, but uh, yeah. So uh, looks like we're pretty much done here. Thank you guys. Um, I think. All right, Laura's saying. What? 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 Oh, okay. She's just talking to uh, Melissa about her story. So, yeah, um, we'll be, you know, there's the Ahad group, and then there's also my group.
group in the Biblical Dead Sea Scrolls. Someone uh, messaged me on Facebook uh, about, uh, I actually reported a, a bunch of posts earlier today for spam. Uh, in the Yahad group, there's a bunch of posts, like, from the one guy, and they're all in all caps. And uh, I didn't report them all as spam. I, I, the first few, I was like, oh, okay. But then, like, it just, one thing after the other, like, you know, after a certain point, it becomes spam. Even if it's a, even if it's a valid post, you shouldn't post that many times in a row in, in a short amount of time. Uh, that is the definition of spam. Yeah. <laughs> So, Spamming the site with your words and yeah. pushing whatever uh, you know, story they want to push. One final thing, in anticipation for whenever we do the interview with me, you're going to be interviewing, you said? Yes, sir. That's what is likely going to happen. All right. Well, um, my Bible project is the person that I'm going to help have help uh the person I'm going to have help me uh, work on this is uh, go, going to start probably in January, and we're going to go through the whole Old Testament. And nice. As it's being done, I'm going to release like by book. Uh, so once each book is done, I'll release it, share it with you guys, and probably do a video study on it. But I wanted to let you guys know that, and uh, stay tuned for updates on that, and uh, I'll give you guys more information when I do that interview thing, whenever we decide to do it. That sounds great. Shalom guys. Have a great weekend. Good Shabbat and see you all soon. Thank you for joining us, brother Onia. And thank you brothers and sisters for tuning in. So hopefully we can catch you tomorrow. I'll be helping with uh, the liturgy. And uh, we're going to let Brother Jackson have a break. I think he's just going to bring the message and we'll be able to share, uh, participate more. And then uh, yeah, I don't know if he has anything going on Sunday night, but on Monday night, we're probably going to do that interview. So keep tuning in. We appreciate you all and your, your uh, we also appreciate your comments and uh, participation. Have a yeah. blessed day, a blessed evening. Yeah, bless. Shalom. Jackson might have to end the call because he's the primary host, possibly. I'm not sure. Oh, I bet you're right. Let me see. I'm going to leave the meeting and see what happens. We can just start talking. <laughs> nah, well, it's still recording. so. Um, oh. Well, he should turn it off or go to another Zoom. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, Emerson, you still on? Because he has his phone on. Um, okay. Can you? Oh, great. Now you can't do it because you logged off. But uh, I was going to say, oh, uh, I was going to say you could actually end the recording possibly if you were.